we've just read from Psalm 14. And it is going to be... <coughs> excuse me. Going to be the obvious next psalm that we're covering in our psalms series. Uh, it is, as you can see, from the beginning of the psalm addressed to the chief musician, and it's a psalm of David. It was to be <coughs> sung in the assembly of the saints and thus addressed to the chief musician. And it's an interesting psalm because uh, it is more... Uh, around doctrine than it is worship, although it is to be sung, and uh, we're going to talk about that this morning. A uh, new word for everyone, uh, certainly a new word for me as I was preparing for this psalm. Uh, this is what a lot of uh, commentators have called, instead of a song, a dirge, a D-I-R-G-E. All right, You can write that in as your new word for the day, a dirge. It's literally a song of mourning and grieving. Uh, it is a song that basically is not a complaint, but it's very clear that it's there to learn from and to be sobered by, and it's almost like, you know, just a flat old um, truth that we need to go back to to remind ourselves to see how low man can really go. Um, this psalm is actually mirrored mirrored in Psalm 53. So if you were to turn to Psalm 53, you would see that there's a very similar looking psalm uh, where again the choir master is commanded to sing uh, and be reminded in the great congregation of these great theological and doctrinal truths of the depravity of man. And uh, if you're good in your Bible referencing here, you'll know that this some of this passage in Psalm 14 and 53 appears somewhere else in the New Testament. Anyone else know where it's going to be? Book of Romans chapter 3. Some of you are getting that. Well done. Chapter 3 verses 10 through 12 if you're interested. Our main theme for this psalm, uh, and we're going to take a few different tracks this morning. It's going to be very interesting for us to to learn and, and grow as believers here today uh, because we're really going into the bedrock of who we are as uh, fallen men and women yet redeemed in our nature by the Lord Jesus. Um, Dr. Stephen Lawson from his commentary on Psalms says that the uh, objectively the Psalms about the entire human race in moral rebellion against God longing for his people uh, to be established in their righteous kingdom. All right, so uh, Dr. Stephen Lawson looks at the objective perspective of the psalm. Everyone has fallen in Adam. We're morally in rebellion against God and we await God to restore his kingdom and to save his people. Where uh, Phil Johnson, Pastor Phil Johnson, um, of, um, uh, who you would know because he's one of John MacArthur's offsiders, says the main theme, uh, not objectively but subjectively, uh, is that God's word um, is spoken to the atheist and we are all included in this word. Because we've all rebelled against God, we all know what it is to say we don't want God's way, we want our way. We all know what it is to be in unbelief. We all know what it is to say I know better than God. Like Adam and Eve in the garden. Yes, God said this, but I'm convinced by the serpent that I think I know better. Uh, and so we choose our own way over God's and therefore we say no to God. And so we've all had to deal with unbelief in our hearts and thus it's a condition that proves our own human depravity. And so Phil Johnson says this is an issue internally to each one of us to remind us of how fallen we really are without Christ. So I think... It's very much a psalm for us today in our modern day context because it, is, it establishes a true world view of how we're to look at the human race outside of Christ. Sometimes we're shocked when we look at the world and go, how bad does it really get out there? 
murdering and killing and all of the atrocities that go on, how bad does it get? And Psalms like this remind us that we shouldn't be surprised. This is what man's really like outside of Christ. And friends, this is what you and I are like if we're not saved and have a redeemed nature and a new heart and a new spirit put in us. We're rotten to the core. None of us are good. No, not one of us. So don't be sitting there today all high and mighty and religious on me thinking, well, this has got nothing to do with me. I'm saved by grace and I'm one of the righteous saints. Well, yes, you are saved by grace and you are a righteous saint, but you are still a sinner. Paul said, I was just reading it yesterday in Romans, the good that I want to do, I end up not doing because sin is dwelling in me and it's making me do some other things. So we're still dealing with sin in us. We're going to be honest here that if we let sin take control of our daily lives, we could get ourselves in a lot of trouble and be right here in this place. The psalm is also relevant to us today because it gives us a right paradigm and a right perspective of where we all land, like it or not. It deals directly with our spiritual condition in the world that we live in. And apart from it being a lament psalm, bewailing the condition of the human race, it reminds us of the utter foolishness. Remember, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The utter foolishness of departing from the true and living God. You're a fool. You're mad. It goes against the height of wisdom to turn your back on the one true and wise God. It's indicative of the height of foolishness to turn away from he who is all wisdom. Amen, everyone? Of course, we're going to learn in this psalm, and it's relevant for us today because uh, a lot of the psalms, uh, and this psalm is a classic, it's a doctrinal psalm that proves that worship songs are designed and written by the Spirit of God, not only to teach praise to God, but to teach right doctrine about God. Did you get that? Psalms are written to not only teach us how to praise God rightly, but psalms are written to teach us right doctrine about God. Not just praise to God, but right doctrine about God. So you notice a lot of the the psalms or the songs we've been singing in hymns, you should be reading them and singing them going, "I, I think I'm learning stuff as I'm singing here. Amen, everyone? I I think this is important. You should be reading. And if not, you should be maybe making a note or listening to the psalm or the song later on during your week and going, what does that mean? What does an Ebenezer mean? You know, what does it mean that I'm hid in Christ? Or what does it mean that, you know, be thou my vision? What is that all talking about? Dig into that. I'm going to encourage our hosts here at church to help us with some of those things as we know we're going to sing a song, maybe take some lines of that song and encourage us as we lead into that song to talk about what it is so as we sing it, there's greater depth and meaning to what we're singing and we're learning as we're singing. Amen, everyone? Now, uh, one author says we should be learning as we're singing, learning about what we would be like if not saved by God, our true condition and left to our own devices. Singing worship songs should engage the mind as well as the heart. Uh, Why don't we just turn quickly here to Colossians 3.16. Keep a finger there in Psalms, but Colossians 3.16 I think is important because many of you know, uh, going back a year or two, we weren't singing like we were singing this morning. They weren't songs that were maybe written the way we're singing them this morning and sung the way we're singing this morning, which is in a congregational, just all together singing. And I want want you to see here that the Bible does clearly mandate that singing is not for our entertainment, not uh, for our uh, feelings alone, although I think as we're singing Scripture, it should cause our feelings to rise to the Lord. Um, Colossians 3.16 here makes it very clear. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you what here? As you sing psalms? And hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart to the Lord. You should be getting taught. You should be getting admonished and correct. And you should be gaining and growing in wisdom as you are singing and worshipping and quoting psalms. Yes, the sermon is the banquet feast, if you like, of the Sunday morning worship session. But at the end of the day, we should be learning and growing through all of our conversations in the foyer, through encouraging one another, through building one another up in the faith. And, of course, through our worship as well. And this psalm, Psalm 14, is a doctrinal psalm. We're going to be learning 
a lot here about um, how we encourage one another uh, through these teachings and this psalm. We're breaking down the psalm really quickly. If you're taking notes, I'll give you the quick outline because it's not up on the screen. The psalm has two main sections. First section is verses 1 through 6. Verses 1 through 6. And this is David's assessment of all of humanity on earth. Verses 1 through 6. David's assessment of all humanity on earth. Which is the bulk of the psalm because there's only seven verses. And then finally, the second portion is verse 7. And this is not David's assessment, but David's appeal. David's appeal to his maker in heaven. Alright, so verses 1 through 6, David's assessment of all humanity on earth. And verse 7, David's appeal to his maker in heaven. Lick to David's assessment, we're going to see in verse 1. Your eye words are what you're writing down here. The insanity and immorality of the world in verse 1. The insanity and immorality of the world. In verses 2 and 3, the inability of the world. The inability of the world to respond to, to seek God, to look to Him. And verses 4 through 6, the ignorance of the world. If you just write down the I words, it's easier to get that. So verses 1 again, the insanity and immorality. Verses 2 and 3, the inability. And verses 4 and 6, the ignorance of the world. Finally, in the second half of the psalm, in David's appeal to heaven, we will see the salvation and restoration of God's people. God always, in the end, will save and keep and redeem his people. And we see this because he will come out of Zion to his great holy city in Jerusalem with his great delivering power. So despite man's fallenness, despite the wickedness that still remains in man after Christ having come, died on the cross and paved a way for the kingdom of God to be inaugurated in the earth, so to speak, we still need and are waiting for the full restoration of all things. Again, Michael alluded to that in this morning, <clears throat> this morning in his text in Isaiah, where it was stated that the Lord again... Um, in Isaiah 2 would come out of Zion um, and so now we get into our text uh, we've got seven verses to cover this morning and we're going to spend about three or four minutes in each verse we're going to focus on a little bit more on the more popular ones which is going to be verse 1 uh, and then verse 3 verse 1 the fool has said in his heart there is no God they are corrupt they've done abominable works and there is none that does good well, obviously, the psalm is addressed to the fool. And the fool here is a person who is not mentally unable to comprehend that there's a God. This isn't a mental issue or a cognitive issue here. This is a moral issue. They're not mentally unwilling. They're morally unwilling to come to God. Everyone knows there's a God. Let's be clear about that. It's clear in nature. It's clear in intelligent design. It's clear in our own conscience. Yet... We are morally unable to come to God in our own devices. We are therefore fools and deny the true and living God by not only our words and what we say in our heart, but in our actions as well. Stephen Lawson says of the fool here, to be sure, he is not an intellectual atheist denying the existence of God. He is a, watch this everyone, a practical atheist who denies God in his life. In his living. Did you get that? The person we're talking about here, the fool, is not an intellectual atheist. They're a practical atheist because they want to live like there's no God. It's a lot more practical for me to think that there is no God and I can just get on with my own life. Make sense, everyone? That's who we're talking about here. The fool has said in his heart, I don't want anything to do with God because it's a real inconvenience to me and my conscience to say that there's going to be a God and I'm going to be judged and I've got to live according to his law and his standard. Make sense? Because I think that's the way the psalm is being painted out by the psalmist. A fool is one that 
uh, Char uh, Stephen Charnock says, uh, he's one of the deeper Puritan writers, a fool is one that has lost his wisdom and right notion of God in divine things, which were communicated to man by creation, but now dead in sin, uh, he is not so much void of those rational faculties as of grace in those faculties. So he just doesn't have grace to comprehend those things. He still has the rational faculties. And he goes on to continue the quote, not one that wants a reason, but abuses his reason to not serve the living God. Note that the words here in your verse 1, the fool says that there is no God. There is, uh, in those words there, is, is in your translations, but it's not in the original Hebrew. It was added to understand the verse. So literally, it should read, the fool has said in his heart, no God, no. No, I will not worship you. No, I will not follow you. No, I will not serve you. No, I will not be Lord to you. You will not be Lord of my life. This is what the fool says. The fool says no to the true and living God. That's how it should read. Some authors believe it's no God for me. In essence, that's true as well in a roundabout way. But the fool has said in his heart, no God, no. And incidentally, this should help us to see that we can be foolish as well when instead of choosing God's way, we say no to God. So it would be very erroneous for us to sit in this room thinking, we're not the fool in this psalm because whenever we say no to God, even in our heart, to obeying one of his commands, we are indicative of the person in this psalm. Now, we don't want to be. That's the last thing we want to be. But let's be honest. The psalm goes on and says, The Lord looked at all the children of men to see if there was any that sought him, any that did good, any that called upon the name of the Lord. And guess what the response was? There's none. So we, the fatal flaw of this morning would be for you to sit here and go, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, I'm not this person in this psalm, because I think we could all fall into the person in this psalm. And yes, there are levels or degrees of atheism. All right, There's the full-blown atheist that we all know, right, everyone? There's no God, it's the Richard Dawkins, it's the whole thing of we don't want a God, we don't believe there's a God, we're not a Christian, we're not interested in the church, and we get what that atheism is, but... To make that the paradigm of atheism would be incorrect. Atheism is any form, full-blown or just hidden, that is literally saying, uh, I don't want to follow God. And that could be a religious person that doesn't want to follow God in their heart. That's an atheist. Because you don't believe God because you're not following Him. This is going to get very touchy in the room because this psalm is pointing fingers uh, right across the board. So it literally reads in the Hebrew, uh, the fool in his heart has said, no God or no Elohim. I'll have other gods, but just not that God. Just not the one true God. Not Christ. I don't want Christ to be my saviour. So when we say no God, we're literally not wanting to obey him or disobey him and we prove, prove the unbelief that's inherent in our own hearts. Um, the psalm is not written, as I've said, to the full-blown atheist, but the practical atheist who says no in obeying God. Uh, Isaiah 29.13 is a classic example of this in a religious form. Isaiah 29.13 the Lord said, because this people draw near to me with their words and honour me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me. Now remember, this psalm is talking about the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. And yet Isaiah, and of course the Lord Jesus in Matthew 15 says, this people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This is an issue of the heart here, everyone. The atheist who is a fool predominantly. Now we live in a world where you've got to be politically correct and to call somebody a fool, you don't believe in God you're an atheist? And to say you know in the lunchroom to somebody at the workplace well I'm a Christian. You believe in God? You believe you're a Christian at all? No I don't believe in God. You're a fool. If you said that to them they'd be like, man I'll take you to court. 
<laughs> and I will sue you or I'll, that's defamation, that's uh, vilifying behaviour, that's, you know, that's you coming against me, I'll have you, you know, I mean at the moment you probably can't get arrested for that but I can tell you probably lose your job if you kind of got up in somebody's face about that. Yet what does the Bible say they are? They are false. And so we're given a real clear picture here. There are full preeminently, one author says, there are full universally, and there are full in practice. Why? Because if you have a look in your verse, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. They're not only corrupt, but they've done abominable works. So not only in your denial of confession, but it ends up outworking in your works. What you say in your heart comes out in your works. Um, Spurgeon says here, the irony is that if a sinner could, by his atheism, destroy the God whom he hates, it would be to say that um, just as a person denied the existence of fire does not prevent it burning a man who is in it. So doubting the existence of God will not stop the judge of all the earth from destroying a rebel who breaks his law. Nay, this atheism is a crime which provokes much of heaven and will bring down terrible vengeance on the fool who indulges it. What Spurgeon's trying to say here in the quote can be a little unclear and I don't think I read it as well as I could have is that just because somebody says they don't believe in a God that doesn't mean that that's going to be true that doesn't deny the fact that just because they don't believe in fire that the fire's not going to burn them when they're standing in the middle of it it's still real and going to have a real effect in their lives Um, and, uh, and this is just the situation that the fool finds themselves in um the issue is in the heart. The heart is corrupt, everyone. Can you see that? They are corrupt because their heart is corrupt. And if this is the root of their um, who they are, uh, it will also produce fruit out of that tree. Because men's heart are depraved, uh, is depraved, blackened by sin and born in sin, um, it will be their very nature. Some other verses to back this up, Proverbs 22.15. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child and the rod of correction drives that out. So just by nature, children embrace folly. Proverbs 22.15 that was. Folly is bound up in their heart and everyone is born into that atheism, born into that foolishness, born into that um, I naturally don't want to believe God because it's not going to help me in my pursuits. Proverbs 19.3 A person's own folly leads to their ruin. Yet their heart rages against the Lord. So folly is something that's initially in our heart. And I think uh, Psalm one, uh, Psalm fourteen one here tells us not only about the fool, but where foolishness is initially bound up in the, in the heart of man. It's a heart issue to start with. Uh, and I think this is why in all churches, in all gospel preaching. Um, the preaching should be done to the heart, not to the head. And, and I think one of the things the Lord's been challenging me on is how I preach. I'm not just trying to teach an academic message. I'm trying to teach a message that should should address your heart and, and go, have you thinking about, man, that's me. Like, I've got to go back to the Lord again and find a place where I'm accurately assessing myself and examining myself and seeing if I'm in the faith and taking scripture and applying it into my life and and I want to preach to the heart I want to preach to you you could be the atheist here you could be the person that has a a religious garb on and and yet you're saying no to the Lord in areas where he's addressing your heart and wanting you to obey and you're saying no you're resisting, you're denying uh, the Lord and you're keeping some parts of yourself and of course, we know from the words of the Lord Jesus, we cannot follow him if we do not take up our cross and deny ourselves. Spurgeon says, this is why the greatest preachers must aim their message not at the head but at the heart of man. And to the heart he must preach the all-conquering love of Jesus. And then by God's grace, win the doubters to the faith of the gospel. Then any hundred, or he will win, sorry, more doubters to faith of the gospel than any hundred of apologists who direct their arguments to the head. Verse 2, we've talked about the fall. Now let's talk about the Lord and what he does. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. 
The omniscient Lord here, the sovereign Lord Yahweh looks down on He knows all things, all people, all thoughts and the hearts of all men, both good and evil. Hebrews 4.13, nothing is hidden in creation from God's sight. Everything is exposed. Everything is uncovered. Yes, we must confess even those who know Christ still contend with their sinful nature and the Lord looks down even on us and sees that even we don't naturally want to seek God and willingly want to understand his ways. By the sixth chapter in Genesis, the Lord looked down on, all, on the earth and found that everyone was corrupt. Their thoughts of their heart were evil continually. And the Lord was repentant and sorrowful that he had made man and decided to, to destroy men from off of the face of the earth and save his people. Eight souls in all on the ark of Noah, representative of the church of the living God. Remember, God comes back and saves those who are called out of the world into his church and he'll do the same thing in the Old Testament except not by water this time, time but by fire in the New Testament. This has been the character and nature of God in the Old and New Testaments and we see this at the end in verse 7 of Psalm 14 and this was the case in Sodom where God went to Sodom saw the wickedness of the city it illustrates the careful matter, management and matter in which divine justice beholds sin and avenges it, searches out the righteous so they do not perish with the guilty. And we'll see this duality in Psalm 14 where the wicked or foolish men, workers of iniquity, do their thing, but God will always have the righteous and his righteous generation in every generation. And he will save them out of Zion and bring their captivity forth uh, and save his people from judgment. So we see here like a, a little macrocosm, if you like, uh, of the story of redemption in Psalm 14 as well, verses 1 through 7. Of course, there's a positive side to this. If the Lord's looking down on the earth and he's seeing that the majority of people are wicked, we still know from Second Chronicles 16.9 that the eyes of the Lord search to and throw throughout the earth for what? Those who hearts diligently want to seek and serve him. And so he's looking, particularly for those whom heart is completely his. And we know that the psalmist who wrote this psalm was one of those people, David, who had a heart after God. And so on a positive side, the Lord still looks and sees not only the wicked and their works and that they are abominable works and there are none that seek him, but he also sees those whom hearts he's changed. And let this be an encouragement to us believers that we should keep our hearts in a right condition because the Lord looks at them each and every moment of each and every day, of each and every month of our lives and they should be holy and um, solely set on Him. Amen, everyone. Verse 3. What is the conclusion after the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men? They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There's none that does good. No, not one. This is the threefold degradation of those who say no to God. In verse 1, we've seen that they are corrupt in heart. They are abominable in works and they are here in verse 2, filthy to God. Literally, the word filthy here is stinks. Their actions, their works, their heart attitude ascends up to God as a stink now we know as the offerings that were done and prepared rightly by the Old Testament priests, it's said that the smell of them went up to the nose of the Lord and it was sweet in the nostrils of the Lord. It was a sweet smelling savour to the Lord. But we know the works of the wicked go up into the nostrils of God and God smells, smells both the stink of the world and the sweet smelling savour of our sacrifices and service to him. So the Lord sees both. And we see here again the Holy Spirit tell us that there is no chance for any of us left our own devices because it uses the crushing threefold negative. And you can highlight it in your Bibles there. None, no, not one. You see them there, the threefold degradation? None, and then no, and then not one. This is the Trinitarian, if you like, or the threefold layering of there's no way we can come to God in our own ability. This is reminding us that we're all 
outside of Christ. Outside of Christ, we are like this, no exceptions. Only God can save us from our corrupt and depraved hearts, which is why we needed a new heart, Ezekiel 36. We all, in our Adamic nature, ran from God. We heard God and we ran and hid. We don't naturally want to come to God. This is what we're like. One author says this verse may remind us that sin is not only in our nature passively as a source of evil, but we ourselves actively fan the flame and left to our own devices continue to corrupt ourselves. Indelibly, another author says we are the ones that put the rivets in our own chain that binds us to our own sins. Strange that the psalmist says that there is none good because when you talk to people and you tell them, hey, do you think you're good? What do they normally say? I think I'm good. I, th I think the Lord would be happy with me if I was to die today and get hit by a car. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't raped anyone. I haven't, uh, you know, sort of done grand theft auto or whatever that might look like for some major sin. But what are they forgetting, everyone? That we're all gone wrong. We're all sinners. One sin in the eyes of a holy God is enough to damn our souls eternally. Now, of course, the fact that if you're already dead in sins, it makes sense that you can see yourself as morally good because you don't know what sin and how that effect has on God and His holy nature because you're dead in sins. You really don't get the depravity in which you're found in. You're dead to the sinfulness of your own nature. It's like just drinking water to you. Um, and of course, this is where all religions are based on, apart from Christianity. Because all religions tell you that you've got to do some form of good work. So Psalm 14 kills every other religion apart from Christianity, which forces you to come to Christ. Because they say in one way, shape or form that you can do some form of good work. You can be good enough and this will contribute to your salvation and being accepted by God in that great last day. And friends, if you can be good enough for God to accept you, you simply don't need Jesus to save you. This is another gospel. And the reason in Luke 18.18, 18, Luke 18.18, 18, that Jesus, when the rich young ruler comes to him and says, Good teacher, what may I do to inherit eternal life? And what does Jesus say? Why are you calling me good? There is none good but one. There is none good but one. He's literally paraphrasing Psalm 14, Psalm 53, and Romans 3, although it wasn't written at that point in time when he said it, and he's saying, only God is good. Only God is good. So man left to his own devices, we will always deny God. We are not going to choose Christ it speaks to our total depravity. And of course the area, era of Arminian thinking where Arminian thinking believes that we're fallen and we're sinful but we still have the ability to choose God somehow. That simply doesn't make sense to me because Jesus tells us quite clearly in John 6.44 no one can come to me. No one can. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So we need the help of God. The testimony of the Bible is that God alone is holy and we're all fallen. We're utterly helpless to save ourselves through good works to be able to reach out to God. So Arminian thinking is like, the way I think about it is arm um, in Arminian. I can do something about it. My arm, I can. there's enough strength still left in my arm to reach out to God and do something. And simply that's not true. Left to our own devices, it's Psalm 14 all over again. None of us choose God. No, not one of us. We're all left to our own desires. We're all atheists in heart. We'll all choose our own way. And we'll all say what to God, everyone? No, God. No, I'm quite happy living my life. I'm quite happy doing my thing. Verse 4, Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? Notice the two types of people now outworked in the psalm, the righteous and the unrighteous. This is the way it's always been. This is the way it always will be. Genesis 
Uh, I think we don't have time to go there, but let's just see in Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelion, the first mention of the Gospel, uh, where it's said, or prophesied, if you like, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, between you and him, that is Satan and Christ. You, that is Satan, will bruise his head, and you will bruise Christ on the heel. Notice that the works of iniquity, the workers of iniquity, they act like they have no idea what's going on. They have no knowledge about God and they persecute God's people. They eat and devour them. They're not only uh, saying no to God, they come against the church. They are now not just atheists. They are wicked in their desires. The scripture compares these types of people and their hateful qualities to lions, bears, to foxes, to wild bulls, greedy swine, scorpions and briars and thorns, grievous and vexing. The scripture represents them as unwearied and industrious in their bloody attack on the church. Herodias gave up half the kingdom to see John the Baptist killed. And Haman would have paid a great fine to the king to see the Jews destroyed. Not only this, but these wicked workers of iniquity, devouring God's people with no knowledge in verse 5, are in great fear. For God is in the generation of the righteous. Interesting verse, because it simply points to the fact that the atheist who says no God knows that there's a God at work in the righteous generation in the church, and they can't do anything about it. They're persecuting the wicked, yet they're in great fear upon this very account because they know in doing so that the very God they deny outwardly is inwardly revealing to them by way of providence, conscience and testimony that God himself is preserving and supporting and prevailing against them in their attack on the just. You've got to wonder about this. Wicked people attacking the church, but the church never seems to die. Wicked people attacking the Bible, but the Bible never seems to go away. They can't get an upper hand against the church, the Bible, God's people, God's pursuits. They can seemingly win for a moment, but then it's one step forward and three steps backward. How is this? And because of this inability for the unrighteous to prevail against the church, it breeds internally, we need to know as the righteous, a great fear in the heart of the wicked. A great fear that they are really raging against him who is all-powerful. Him who is unstoppable. Have a look at Acts 5.38. I know I'm winding it up here. Got a couple more verses to go, but stay with me. These are the words of Gamaliel as he was questioned on whether to continue to persecute the righteous people of God or not. And he says in Acts 5.38, quite wisely, So in the present case I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or endeavor is of human origin, it's going to fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop them. You may even find yourself fighting against God. And this is where the fear of the unrighteous and the atheist comes in. Because they know in their heart that there is a God who will judge, a God who is on the side of the church. And we must think about everyone who debates and rails and, and goes against every Christian, every atheist out there. There is a fear in their heart that God has placed within them in their own conscience that goes, oh, I'm, I'm probably going to be maybe up for something here. And it burdens them and it rails inside them. One author says a panic of terror seizes them. An undefinable horror mysteriously has crept over them. Haman trembled that God's Mordecai eyes and Pharaoh couldn't even explain how Moses seemed to always get the upper hand. And although he hardened his heart to God's people, he had to let them go. Thomas Goodwin says of this another example. In the Old Testament, it's recorded of David that although Saul hated him and sought to destroy him, yet Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. Quote from Thomas Goodwin. So even though as saints we may be in a lowly position, 
The unbeliever still knows the believer's true nobility and that God is on their side. I want you to see here, it says in verse 5, that God is in the generation of the righteous. Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee, is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over you with singing. Verse 6, You've shamed the counsel of the poor because the Lord is his refuge. The, the wicked mock the righteous because all of their hope is in the Lord and they mock them and say, well, all your hope's in God. What's he doing for you? What's all your prayers doing for you? What are all your efforts and service doing for you? And they taunt the Lord, the Lord's people. And they thrust these accusations in their faces. Yet we should not be ashamed, believers, that the Lord is our refuge. There is no other greater place to take our refuge and our rest in. And we must take heart that we should not be laughed out of our confidence by these wicked scorners. We should defy their jeers. We need to wait simply but a little, and the Lord, our refuge, will avenge his elect. Verse 7, David's appeal now to heaven, O that the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion, when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people. Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. One thing we need to see here is that God always has his people in every generation. Amen? Always has his people and will always avenge them and support them and save his people fully and finally and eternally. Christ will come down from the heavens and reign from the holy city, uh, Jerusalem, and bring back the captivity of his people. Notice his people are recognized here as... Jacob or Israel or his people. It's a threefold description. It is not all the world that the Lord will save. It's his people. It's his Jacob, not Esau. It's his Israel, not the Canaanites or the Hittites. God has his chosen elect. Out of all those who scorn the Lord and come against God's people, God has his chosen people. As we've heard this morning, out of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and he will save them out of Zion. His Israel, His saved, His chosen people. And He will save them. Notice the um, anticipation and the guarantee in verse 7 here of when and shall in the text or will. It speaks of the certainty of the Lord making good on His promises. Let's read it again. Oh, that the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people. Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. It's a covenanted form of word promise that the Lord who promised shall prevail. The Lord who gives his promise shall fulfill. Well, believers, we can be glad that the ultimate defeat of atheism atheism will be seen at the last day. And it will be seen by all believers and unbelievers that God is Lord over his people and does what is right in his eyes. God's people will be glad and rejoice, for God has shown himself to be faithful, righteous, and true to his covenant promises. And interestingly, of atheists, the Puritans had a little rhyme that they would quote to one another when the atheists seemed to get the upper hand. And I close out on this quote. It went like this. On earth there are atheists many, and in hell there is not any. So as we close out this psalm, let's remember the great words of Titus 3.4. But when the kindness of God our Saviour And his love for mankind appeared, knowing our state, knowing our situation. He saved us. Not by the righteous deeds we had done, but according to his great mercy, through the washing of new birth, born again, and renewal by the Holy Spirit, this is the Spirit he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Let us be thankful. We're going to finish uh, this morning with a song to the praise, uh, and then we'll close.